Hello, YouTube. This is you, Mozo3. In the previous lesson, we basically had a chance to review frozen dictionaries, right? We've kind of been trying to summarize a lot of the topics we've been talking about in recent videos, because this is probably going to be the last video of the curriculum. So I just wanted to review some of the things we learned at the end so that you can come away from this curriculum with a good grasp of all the material that we talked about. I, I taught you pretty much probably about 99% of what there is to know about Python. So hopefully it's been a good curriculum for you, but we can go ahead and jump back into our review. And one of the things we talked about in the previous video is this idea of a constructor reference variable, right? We've already known since lesson 15 about function reference variables and this idea that if you create a function f of x, y, and then you call something like z equals f, what that does is it allows you to treat z as an alias or as a variable to refer to the f function. So then if you say, you could either say f of 3, 12, right? You could pass in two inputs into f, or you could call z of 3, 12, because now you've created an association between z and f, where now this new function, all of a sudden, z has been spun up to work the exact same way as f has, but as uh, the exact same way that f did. But you can have that for constructors in particular, right? But the point, the, really the only thing you have to remember here is that every constructor is a type of function. So then if you have a constructor C of X, Y, dot, 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 and then you call D equals C, then you could either call W equals C of A, B, right? And then that would create an instance of your class and call it W. Or you could say W equals D of A, B, dot, 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 right? You could use the alias. You could use the variable, which is referring to the constructor C. So if you call D equals C, it just basically gives you another constructor to use, right? But it works the same way. So that just gives you another option. And then I guess by the same token, now if you call CRV equals D, right? Like constructor reference variable equals D. Now CRV is an indirect constructor reference variable for C through D. So not only could you call W equals C of A, B, dot, dot, dot. Not only could you create an instance based on the native constructor C, not only could you say W equals D of AB dot, 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 right? Using that first constructor reference variable that's talked about on line 82, but then you could also say W equals CRV of AB dot, 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 because you created a constructor reference variable based on another constructor reference variable based on one of the constructors of your class. And so then this is something we saw in the previous video, right? Where we created a regular dictionary um, on lines 90 through 94. And then on 97, we say FD equals frozen dictionary. So that creates what's called a constructor reference variable. And then you can use FD rather than needing to say frozen dictionary. But the point is that now if you, now if you say equals FD of something, it invokes the frozen dictionary constructor. So hopefully that's clear to you. But we talked about some of the functionality of frozen dictionaries in the previous video. And I sort of wanted to pick up where we left off, right? On line 119, we have a callable, we have a lambda function, right? Y equals lambda TZ callable of T. So it sets up a function with two inputs and it just returns whether or not the first input is callable, right? So if you say print Y of T2 with 100, well, remember T2 was one of the instances of our frozen dictionary class, which is not callable. So that would be false. But then if you say Y of T4 with 700, that would be this true right here because T4 is an instance of the callable frozen dictionary class, according to line 117. And then according to to line 72, the callable frozen dictionary class supplies a call magic method, which is what allows it to be callable, unlike the regular frozen dictionary superclass. So hopefully that's clear to you. But then what we could do is we could say print T4. So what's the result of calling the T4, like, like treating T4, an instance of a class, as though it were a function that you could pass in some number of inputs into? But if you just call T4 without any inputs, remember we talked about this call magic method in the previous video. So if we don't pass any inputs into our instance of the class, it would return false. But if we do pass inputs, right, like if we pass, if the length of this implied tuple is at least one, then you return, then you return true. But then when we invoke it on line 124, when we just say print T4, well, you're not sticking in any inputs, that would be false. Okay, so that's why you get the false right here. That's what this false would be. So if you say print both true, print string of T4 and T4 of pasta and octopus, right? So that would test the call magic method again, right? But T4 without any inputs is false. And T4 with any number of inputs greater than like at least one input would be true, right? So false and true, that would be false, right? So both true, false. But then if you say false or true, right, it's okay that you say T4 of false. Technically, that would be true because like false is at least one input. So T4 of false would be true. So false or true is true. And that's why you get either true 
true. So hopefully that's clear to you. And then we can keep reviewing this code, right? So print t2.f, we talked about this function f, right? f of x right here, x is not an input, x is a symbol to Python that f is an instance method. So that would just return a if you called it on t2, which is an instance of the frozen dictionary class. But then if you call f on t4, which is an instance of the callable frozen dictionary subclass, you would get eight squared, the floating representation, floating point representation of eight squared, which is 64.0 because we said the way that the F works in the subclass is to return the result of the superclasses F raised to the power of two, and then like the floating point representation of it. So that's why you get 64.0 printed on the console when we say print T4.F. Real quick review of hex numbers, right? For an int T, hex of T is the hexadecimal base 16 representation of T beginning with zero X, right? And then int of Y can accept the hexadecimal literal Y, like int of zero X five, four, like an actual, uh, um, hexadecimal number rather than like a variable beginning with zero X and returns the base 10 representation, right? So int of zero X two zero, we'll think about that. That would be 16 times two plus one times zero. So int of zero X two zero be 32 because 20 in hexadecimal would be 32 in decimal. And then remember ord of X accepts a character X and returns the corresponding ASCII character code and CHR of X is the inverse. So that would accept an ASCII character code and return the corresponding character. And we talked about that a fair amount in lesson 68, but I think we also reviewed it in lessons 69 and 70. And then in 69, we also talked about zip of XY. So zip of XY is a generator that yields AB. It yields tuples AB, where A and B are corresponding elements belonging to two same length iterables, X and Y, and they don't have to be the same iterable type. So it doesn't have to accept two lists. It could accept a tuple in a set or, or two tuples, for example, but that's what you have going on with zip. So we're going to be reviewing that in this video. So we're going to create a function reference variable on line 144. It's going to be a review of hexadecimal numbers. So hex flex equals hex, right? We're just going to call an alias hex flex, but we're referring it to it as hex, like the standard function in Python. So if you say print hex flex of 72, that would be 48. Why? Because 72, this would be basically 4 times 16 plus 8 times 1, right? This would be 64 plus 8 is 72. You have to add up the powers of 16 and figure out how many of each power of 16 you have, because that's the point of hexadecimal numbers is that it's a base 16 representation rather than base 10. So you have to do a little bit of math here. And then hex flex of 79, well, that would be 4F, right? Because we said A, B, C, D, E, F, that corresponds to 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So what's 64, right? 16 times 4 is, that's why you get a 4 here, because it would be 4 times 16. But then you have to add on 15, right? So 64 plus 15, that F is 79. And F here is a, is a valid digit in the hexadecimal universe. And print is uh, int of 0x40. Well, what's 4 times 16? plus zero times one, that would be 64. So that's why we get 64 printed on the console. Print int of zero X F F F F. So this will be 15 times 16 times 16 times 16 plus 15 times 16 times 16 plus 15 times 16 plus 15, right? You can see it's just a lot of these 15s applied to each of the powers of 16. So that would actually be 65,535. It's the highest value in each of your significant digits that you possibly can have before you need to spill over to the next significant digit, right? So if you add one to FFFF, well, that would require you to have another digit. So now if you do 0x10000, that would just give you literally one bigger, it would be 65,536, but hopefully you understand the math there. And we can review inner functions real quick. So define outer of x, y. So you can have one inner function, inner one, which just defines ord of x, right? Because x here is not an input to inner one, but inner one is defined within outer, which does specify an x, right? So you'd return ord of x, like the ASCII code representation of a particular character x. And inner two would be the inverse, right? So it would be actually the character associated with some ASCII character code Y, right? But we said those are opposites of each other. And you could say, for example, print ASCII code of the first input and then just string up the result of calling inner one. And then you could also say the character with the ASCII code in the second input, right? The opposite, the inverse of that would just be the string representation of calling inner two. So that will give you CHR of whatever ASCII character code you passed in. And then just for fun, we can say that this method is instructed to return a false Boolean. So if you say something like W equals outer of, you know, two inputs, right? Well, the first one would be a character and the second one would be an ASCII character code. 
technically by calling that you would run the code right you would print these two statements but the result of that boolean like whatever you set the output of the function equal to that boolean would be false so hopefully that's clear to you but we're going to say if outer of ampersand sign the and sign comma 121 print hey so first it has to evaluate this right it makes a call to this function and so you're going to get two things printed on the console so the ascii code of the ampersand sign apparently is 38 right because it would be calling the inner one function and then the and then so uh so that would be that would be 38 and then the what's the character associated with ascii character code 121 well, that'd be lowercase y and you could go on to google and verify that for yourself if you wanted but otherwise you would print sup. So we end up printing sup because the result of the outer function call, like we still run the function, but the result of outer, like what is the result of out, what is outer equal to? And technically it will be false. That's why we print sup on the console instead of hey. And then we can review zip. So I wanted to review zip and pass by value and iterators. So Y equals zip. So A, so we're going to have one tuple, two, 21 and 15. And then we have another tuple, B equals happy, false, true or false, right? But um, these don't, these don't both have to be tuples. You can mix and match the data structures if you use zip of X, Y. So again, we said zip is a generator. So if you just say print zip of A, B, it just says zip object, right? And then like a hexadecimal representation of the hash code or something. But then if you say for K and zip of A, B, print K. So that would be a tuple too happy. And then the tuple 21 false. And then the tuple 15 true because true or false evaluates the true. And then you could get the set representation of it. So print set concatenated with string of set of zip of a b so that would be set and then you get a set representation of those three tuples or frozen set print frozen set and then string of frozen set of zip of a b so that will give you the frozen set implementation of those three tuples that were yielded by the zip generator and then pass by values. Remember, Python and other programming languages pass information into functions by copying their values rather than bringing in their actual in, um, identities by reference. So you need to either keep up with a variable associated with an instance of a class, right? We talked about this in the previous video, or you can return a value rather than attempting to reassign it in some standalone static method, which doesn't return anything. Or you can work with a list instead of just one element, right? But you'd work with a list and it, the um, list would successfully be updated so we have an example here we say define g of x and then x equals not x so on your own we talked about doc strings and how it's good when you become a software engineer to have good thorough documentation so that you can explain to stakeholders what it is that your code does but here you can fill that in on your own but this seems like it attempts to invert a boolean right it accepts an x right this is not in a class so here x is actually an input it's like a standalone function just by itself. So define g of x and it says x equals not x, right? So for, so idea, so for example, if you pass in like true, right? If x equals true, then it seems like it would invert the x to be false, right? Because not true would be false. Not false would be true. So we say value equals false. And then we're going to say g of value. So we're going to invert this value apparently to be, go from false to true. Like, like that's what it seems like it's supposed to do. But then if you say print value, it still says false here. So it's like the false didn't get knotted. It didn't get inverted. And that's the example of pass by value. The only difference in this video is that we're doing it with a Boolean rather than an integer. But the point is that this happens not just for integers, not just for Booleans, but also for strings, right? It happens just for these general primitive data types where it seems like the value of value um, failed to be updated on line 204. And so there are three approaches that we said you can take to this phenomenon. So class C, to find init of self C, right? So you create a class and we're gonna decide to make this instance variable private. So we have two underscores. Remember, if you have two underscores, it makes an instance variable strongly private so that you couldn't directly refer to that instance variable or change that instance variable outside of the class in which it was defined. We talked about that in like lessons 38, 39, 40, 41. But you could say change of self, right? So change, but this doesn't accept any inputs. This just indicates to Python that it's an instance method. And you could say self.v equals not self.v, right? It's a strongly private instance variable, but the point is that you would be inverting the value of this v instance variable. And then we can have a property, right? So in order to make a strongly private instance variable accessible outside the class, you could say define v, and you sort of set up this instance variable as though it were a function that you could call, right? But it would say you using the property to get a private instance variable, you'd want to print that string and indicate to people that that's what you're doing, right? And then you could just say, you know, basically self.v, but you would return 
the current instances value for that strongly private instance variable. But that's the example of a property. And we've talked about that before. And then you can have a sunshine method, right? So this would be the second solution that you would have is you could just return the inverted version, right? Instead of saying like X equals not X, like we said here on 199 and 200, you could return the, the, the inverted. So you could say return, not you. So it accepts like a Boolean, presumably, and it returns the inverse of the Boolean. This would be another solution to the pass by value phenomenon that we said is that you can just return the inverted value or return the incremented or updated value. And then you can also have a class method. So this would be the third solution that you would have to pass by value, right? So you could pass in one input, right? C just indicates that it's a class method because we have this class method indicator, but then you have D, right? So it, it seems like it accepts a list, right? Because it's going to say D of zero equals not D of zero. But these, these sort of summarize the three solutions that you have to the pass by value, right? So you either, uh, I'm trying to scroll so you can see all three, right? But this would be the first approach is that you, that you update an instance variable within the context of your class. The second approach is that you return a value rather than not returning a value. And then the third approach is that you use a list instead, right? And then you can have a, finally a print element method, which would just print X of zero, right? But you would, it seems like it's an instance method, but it accepts a list and it returns the first element within the list. So you say first solution equals false, and then first element equals C of first solution. So it's gonna pass in this false Boolean to be the instance variable associated with this first element instance. And then you call the change method on that instance, right? You say first element dot change. And then, so if you say print first element dot V, well, now you get true, right? Cause the false is successfully updated to true. So that would be one solution that you have to the pass by value phenomenon is to use an instance variable attached to a class. You could also say print starting and then string of walrus colon equals false. So it, this is a walrus operator, right? It creates a variable called walrus and assigns it to false. So you say starting and then false because that's what walrus is. But then if you say print ending and then string representation of C dot sunshine of walrus, right? So then remember the sunshine method just returns the inverted Boolean. So return not you. And it looks like it was successfully changed, right? Sunshine of walrus would be true, right? Because not false would be true, but it looks like it was successfully updated. And that's the second solution that you have to pass by value. And the third one is to use a list, right? So you say third solution equals the list with just true, with just false in it, right? Because true and false would be false, right? So it's just a list with one Boolean in it. And then you could say C dot bagel of third solution. So this is the third approach where instead of just using a value, you're using a list with at least one element in it and it says D of zero equals not D of zero. So C dot bagel of third solution. Then if you say print first element dot print element of third solution, then you would go ahead and get true, right? Because we said the print element method, it's called on an instance of a class, but it accepts a list and returns the first element in the list. So it looks like it was successfully updated. What we can do in this video is we can talk more, uh, we can talk about shorthand notation for sets and dictionaries. So we're gonna be, we're gonna need to sort of review this in the next video, but what we can do just real briefly is we can let S and F be a set and a frozen set respectively. And so remember we were talking about sets and we've been talking about sets since like lesson 22 or 23 or something. And then, and then frozen sets since I think lesson 57, so a little more recently, but we say S dot union of F would be a regular set containing all elements in S or F, right? It's based on the what you call union or intersection on is the type of set that's returned. So if you say regular set dot union or dot intersection of frozen set, you get a regular set. If you say frozen set dot union or intersection of regular set, you get a frozen set. So hopefully that's clear to you. But the point, I guess what we're going to have to talk about in the next video is that you can also have shorthand notation. So instead of calling S dot union of F, writing all that out, you can have S and then this or symbol. So this vertical bar here. So S or F, and that would be shorthand for S dot union of F, right? And then for example, another example, so F dot intersection of S, right? Instead of all those keystrokes to write out that long word intersection, you can instead just do an ampersand sign like this and symbol, right? You could say F and S is shorthand for F dot intersection of S, okay? So instead of making a, a whole nother video, I think what we're gonna do is just finish this one. So my set equals frozen set of 29522. So it's gonna create a frozen set and it's gonna say your set equals 320. So that's a regular set. So if you say print my set dot union of your set, well, that, that, would be, that would be a frozen set, right? Because you called it on a frozen set and it gives you all the elements that appear in at least one of those two sets. 
But then if you say your set dot union of my set, well, you get the same elements, but this time it's a regular set instead of a frozen set. So hopefully that's clear to you from UMOS03. Thanks for watching and please subscribe.